We don't cross the line much. Armchair admirals will tell you it's because crossing with a fleet looks like you're invading packed space, i.e. outright war, which will be met with interstellar faster than light missiles, quickly spiralling out of control. Crossing the line will result in the galactic game of frame rocks and seeing whose resolve and homeworld cracks first. But they're not quite correct. Sure, a concerted crossing, going deep into their territory, would indeed look like an invasion of all packed space. But we in the fleet all know that there are three lines. There's the line, the official border between us and the packed nations. And about ten light years in, there is another line. Cross that one, and it's no longer a border incursion. It's war. Planets start getting cracked. Same thing on our side. The League of Balorf will not tolerate ten light years. Within that, sure, they'll fight back in force if we cross and take a system, but if we can keep it, lines are just. Now, in the early days, where the Hecateans were still rebranding as the Commonwealth, the Acternians hadn't joined the Pact, and humanity was the species triumphant in ground combat where we barely any space-going fleet. We did cross a lot, and there would be big fights. The Hecateans did alright then. They had a spacefaring tradition, but they were using the same weapons we'd already seen for decades. Centuries, frankly. Particle beams, lasers, plasma launchers, nuclear warheads on contact detonating missiles, that type of stuff. The humans were pretty much the same at that point, except a lot worse, because, well, you know about the whole deal with them. In the space of a few years, they went from life elsewhere in the galaxy being a hotly debated theoretical to standing victorious over the cause of the Hecatean Stellar Imperium, for events too complex to recap here. It was astounding, and a brilliant success for them. It also left them having to work out how this space warfare as scale stuff worked, and they could only really use Hecatean designs. They tried, oh by god they tried, but they weren't quite ready for it. Slowly they got better and better tactically, but they were still stuck with the same designs as the Hecateans on the front line, so to speak. We saw the new custom models they started to churn out of Ceres and Titan, but they were all kept in reserve, never allowed near combat, and certainly never anywhere our spies could get a look at them. But that changed, real quick. It had been assumed as a fact of life that the humans would remain a minor player in space warfare, until the day the Fifth Fleet sent four of its battle groups to, well, poke the sleeping Loptyops as the saying goes. The fleet commander, a wonderful admiral, friend of my mother, Plan to lure out one of the best admirals the Hecateans had, and trap him. Force him to fight without his back to a planet, so we can nail it with an ISFM to the face. Nice, easy victory, and we get to keep a highly contested planet from it. They started preparing the press pieces about the Battle of Mitrovax, and it's generally called to this day, before the fleet even departed. I was there, as bridge crew on the flagship of Battle Group C, the Indomitable. Personally, I say less battle of Mitrovax, and more slaughter of Mitrovax, or disaster of Mitrovax, mistake of Mitrovax, but that's a joke that only works in one specific human language. Perfectly timed, though, I'll say that in favour of the plan. Battle groups A, B and C jumped into Mitrovax Free A's orbit, and switched away its defences without trouble. Launched a ground assault on the planet itself, partly to knock out planetary based sensors, partly to start setting up in our new acquisition. Then a few strike formations went out and hunted for other sensors in the vicinity. With that done, Battle Group D, reinforced with a third of each other battle group, jumped in behind Mitrovax 3B, his tidally locked moon. They were the trap element here. They'd hold position behind 3B, in sense of shadow form, anything the other battle groups had missed. When the Hecteans arrived to fight A, B and C, something we expected to happen in about a day or two, D would come in from the flank, launch an ISFM from their arsenal ship, and now the Hecatean commander. Then it would be a quick and easy job to cut down what was left. Instead, Battle Group D was engaged first, less than an hour after arrival. We still don't know how the humans figured out the plan or timings. Obviously they aren't wanting to share beyond publicly saying that we guessed right. Some say they're geniuses who had positioned concealed sensors perfectly years in advance. Some say they had a spy in the fleet. Others say signal intercepts were all free. Plenty more conspiracy theories abound, and there's even one school of thought that says the whole thing was basically an accident, and the humans had just stumbled across Battle Group D, not knowing what was happening. My own research, and gut instinct, says the humans aren't lying. They guessed right, and they laid out concealed sensors across 3B, in exactly the right spots for what was coming. 
They jumped 60 destroyers into the middle of battle group D. Literally. That skill. Utterly immense skill and dedication you couldn't find anywhere else. They'd had to have disabled their anti-collision systems to prevent an early automatic deceleration, meaning that even a single mistake could have been catastrophic. But beyond that, Battlegroup D had just shy of 300 ships total. That, right there, is where the accident theory comes from. Of course, reality is you don't have 60 warships performing a simultaneous jump from below the galactic plane into the same spot like that by accident. But crucially, the accident theory is funny, so I can see why it's popular. The first thing the human force did was slam the engines on at full power, accelerating out of the mist of Battlegroup D. The second was to start spraying the void around them with core guns. D, of course, weren't expecting core guns. The shields were fine-tuned to do with plasma first and foremost. These barrages wrecked shields, caused chaos, disabled guns, they even killed a few ships. Every close-range system they had was blazing away, and it immediately disrupted everything. We in battle groups A, B, and C had no idea, of course, because there was a moon in the way, and... Sorry, you had a question? Why would they accelerate out if they intentionally put themselves in our midst? Because the point was the initial chaos. Getting that close to your enemy is a serious risk, one that can pay off, but only if you're careful about it. Accelerating out meant they got the benefits with as little risk as possible. They lost ships, of course, but less than they would have if they stayed put in the middle. So, where was I? Oh yes, the comms and coil guns. The reason we knew so little was because human frigates jumped in and cut the relay of comm satellites we'd set up, and the destroyers, they unleashed their second trick. Missiles. A thick rain of them. At that short range, shields down or wounded, and with our CIWs blooded and broken, even regular contact destination nukes would have been deadly to a decent amount of ships. They didn't use regular ones. The missiles are yet another thing we still don't understand entirely. We know the theory behind them, but we don't understand what they use to make it happen. In short, they don't use nukes as their warheads. Instead, they use the nuke to propel a bit of metal at absurd velocities. A nuclear explosive form penetrator. The theory is obvious, and we know how to put it into practice to some extent. What we don't understand is how they got it so effective. They must have some sort of ultra-resistant alloy to get flung at such high speeds, and some way of directing the nuke's energy sufficiently. The same goes for the other ace missile. They call it a... Uh, Kazaba Howitzer, that's the term. Much the same principle, except the bit of metal isn't flung, it's vaporised, and that's used as a plasma beam. That's right, beam. They turn nuclear weapons into a single-use, ultra-deadly particle lance. One hit can gut an unprepared destroyer in the blink of an eye. Free a cruiser. These missiles are programmed to form a pattern around the ship's hull, and fire for maximum effect. For big ships, there's one through the bridge, one from bow to stern, and one through the engine. If there's enough, they'll throw another two on diagonals, covering the absolute maximum possible internal volume of the doomed ship. What they really love is to use both systems in tandem at the same site, one after the other. If shores are up, the penetrator wave breaks through and makes cracks in the armour, maybe even breaks through on its own. Then the Casper Howitzer fires directly into that crack and melts decks away. We'd never seen either of these before, you must understand. The fleet would have been unprepared under ideal circumstances. CIWs back then didn't have good enough effective range to intercept before the missiles fired. Nowadays it's possible, but you would not want to bet on it. But then, it was damaged. Underpowered systems. It was a slaughter. The cruisers and battleships, they were hit hardest. Frankly, the humans hit way too hard. Theories on that they had no idea how much was kill. So it is simple and went with overkill. I had a friend on one of the frigates that got destroyed. He survived only because the beam narrowly missed the reactor. He said that run to the escape pod was the longest run in his entire life. As the destroyers continue to accelerate out, they unleash their last trick. A swarm of mines with the same loadouts as the missiles. Mines are really useful in orbital warfare, where 99.9% .9 of all space battles happen. You know where the enemy is going to be, and you can use the mines to wreak havoc, or channel them as you wish. Plus, unlike missiles, they don't need that much fuel or manoeuvring ability, so you can basically stack them all over your hull, and let them loose as necessary. Not unfairly, Battlegroup D had had enough at this point, and with the mines now floating around, I decided there was very little point remaining in place. Their drives had recharged, so they made a short jump to elsewhere in the system, to try and get some respite and work out what the hell was going on. They looked for options, and started preparing the jump in record time. You might have noticed the second part of what I said about the mines. They channel the enemy. The humans have scattered them in a couple of long ribbons, locking off multiple angles, 
Combat jobs are always performed, so you have some sort of stellar object in the vicinity to prevent the enemy wiping you with ISFMs. So the fleet only had one option at this point. Orbiter Mitrovax 6. They arrived without incident and began reorganising, recharging their shields, and generally effecting repairs. And then an entire human fleet jumped in. They had been waiting a few seconds of jump time away, which meant they were on the scene in less than a minute, accounting for signal delay and quick collision computing. What followed was an engagement so one-sided, overwhelming numbers and technology against a more battle group, that when the humans say they took no losses in it, no serious person attempts to dispute it. In this engagement, 5th Fleet's commander was killed, his second in command was killed, and the Trelax Naval Academy class of 2078 was wiped out to a man. Only a handful of ships survived because their captains had been more on the ball and ordered to surrender. By this point, those of us in battle groups A, B, and C knew something was up. The relay satellites had gotten some warning out, and the failure to respond only further concerned its commanders. Battle group C, the one I was in, moved to investigate. We found a huge debris field, some human escape pods, many more league escape pods filled with confused and stunned sailors, and several league ships that had been too damaged to make the jump. We also detected the human fleet, fully grouped, now menacingly orbiting Mitrovax 6. Their destroyers had recharged their dryers and had jumped off, forming one huge cohesive force. We had lost all our in-system ISFMs in the first bit of the battle, so this fight would have to be purely conventional. In accordance with Doctrine, we dropped search and rescue beacons, and then returned to the rest of the force as it repositioned to face the humans. We scrounged up every bit of data we could in those minutes, started analysing it as fast as possible, trying to come up with a plan. I've never felt so much strain in my mind as in those minutes, let me tell you. Everything we recovered is seared into my mind as we were rolling it over in our heads again and again. It's testament enough to just how good we were that by the time our drives had recharged, we managed to reposition and reshape the formation totally in what we thought was the best pattern. Hell, we were even starting work on S.H.I.E.L.D. returning to deal with the core guns. Of course, now was the point that the Hecateans showed up. They smashed into our three battle groups, doing the worst job pound for pound than the humans had, but still wreaking havoc on us. Once more we had to turn and adjust formation, at which point the humans jumped in behind us and closed the trap in all three dimensions. The whole time, as they fired, they broadcasted repeat orders for us to surrender. Deafening calls. They jammed our cars between ships and bled the demands over them. I'm only talking to you because the captain of my ship defied our battle group's admiral to his face and had a surrender. Many other crews were not so fortunate. Once we were done, every ship had broken hull or surrendered. The human Hecatian fleet turned their attention to our ground forces. Demands were repeated as troop transports began jumping in. The general in command was either too slow on the uptake or too stunned to acknowledge what had just happened and failed to surrender. His new command post was demolished with him inside by a trio of precision guided bombs and his successor was running up the white flag shortly thereafter. So ended the Battle of Mitrovax. Every league ship sent was destroyed, crippled beyond repair or captured, the humans refusing to return the latter. We were repatriated after a month, and I can tell you, they did not lay so much as a finger upon us except to treat wounds, though they did make clear we could defect if we wanted. The ground forces at least only suffered 64 deaths and 127 wounded, out of a brigade strength formation. The humans and Acacians then launched a brief counteroffensive across the line, seizing back every system we had taken in the back and forth of the past few decades. For the loss of these ships, and 76% of the crew, the highest loss rate of any non-ISFM engagement in history, we had gained nothing. The human fleet was so lightly harmed, they were doing parade laps at full strength mere months later. So what have we learned? We learned that human destroyer crews are their best. We think of destroyers as a terrible first assignment, Packed with inexperienced crews who want to get off a cannon fodder ship as soon as possible. But the humans and their allies, they take pride in being destroyer crew. They consider themselves elite, best of the best, that their job is to charge in, wreak havoc, and have the other ships clear up. They're not suicidal. No, God no. They're trained, and they care. And that's the kind of mindset you need to have 70 ships agree to disable their automatic collision systems, and willingly thread needles through space to wind up surrounded by enemy ships. We learned we had drastically underestimated human technology. That they had intentionally kept their best gear off the front lines for years on end to ensure they had a large enough fleet for one decisive move. That they had found an area and exploited it until they had an insurmountable technological advantage. And I mean insurmountable. It took more battles for us to even realise what the missiles were, and after that we tried to replicate it, but no dice. 
There's theories on how they channel it. Theories on how to make the specific alloys. Theories, 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 but no further. We're so far behind on it, and the humans keep improving. The R&D just decided to stop working on it, improve known tech we already had, rather than set off down a whole new path in pursuit of an enemy miles ahead. Plus, their spies are very good at hampering our research. Very. We learn that humans value planned chaos above all else. That may sound like an oxymoron, but it's simple really. They prize chaos as a weapon, seeking to inflict it, channel it, utilize it at decisive points. That doesn't mean some sort of can't predict our moves if we don't know what we're doing nonsense. It means their plans are designed to break the plans of their enemies and shatter every possible fallback option. 70 destroyers with weapons we'd never seen before right in the middle of our fleet. That was planned chaos made manifest. I learned that human ships are strangely beautiful. Once all the mines they strap on have been ejected, you see these sleek, angular ships that exude power. They're extremely menacing to be around in normal times. Watching one unleash his missiles is awe-inspiring. The cover smoothly gliding off, missiles popping out and speeding away into the distance. They even carry their names prominently, so you know exactly which ship you're dealing with each time. Nothing quite like watching a frigate called UNV walk backwards into hell, going toe to toe with a cruiser three times its size and winning. And we learned, most importantly of all, don't cross the line if you value your life or your ship.